to your visits. Good morning. It's nice to see so many people who believe in helping others the way that you do. I am here to let you know how important your contribution is as volunteer visitors to the prisoner. Thank you very much. I'm going to have a look at that right now. <laughs> Prison is a horrible place, and you'll be in a position to make a di big difference in the lives of people who need your help the most. To care and help others like Jesus is a wonderful thing to do. Not only can it change a life, it rewards you with a friendship that is a blessing. As they grow, you grow. I was in Dorchester Penitentiary, far away from my family, so visiting them was rare. It was just too expensive for them to come that distance on a regular basis. I had volunteer visitors, and they became a second family to me. They were very special people. John and Shirley DeWitt, who came on a regular schedule to be my friends. <coughs> In their own kind way, they witnessed to me. And it is important they, how important it was to have Jesus in my heart. It was a slow going exercise, but I remember it with gladness. My wrongful imprisonment was something that made life inside those stone walls a unique hardship. All prisoners, guilty or not guilty, live this hardship on a day to day, in a day to day routine. Love can make a difference, and new friendships offer hope to prisoners and gives them something special to look forward to. The very worst reality of prison is people live with a rule of thumb that it is okay to do wrong to some extent. I want to say that again because that's important to all of you here, whether you're volunteer visitors yet or you've been volunteer visitors working with prisoners. <coughs> the very worst reality of prison is that people live with a rule of thumb that it is okay to do wrong to some extent. Over time, this type of living takes your morality away. Everyone talking about doing things that are bad destroys life's blessings. Young prisoners listen to others and fall into the bad habits of others so quickly sometimes. It is important for them to hear from you about your lives. You can share with them Whatever you want, it will help them a lot. It is important to remember they may not want to hear about God or Jesus right away on your first visit. I suggest you just be a friend, play some cards, let them see you as you are, just someone new to meet. You should try not to be too questioning about why they are inside. Let that information come out from them when they feel comfortable to talk to you about it. There is another issue of importance you should be aware of. Some prisoners may ask you to give them money in a visit. You must always follow the rules. You cannot pass anything in a visit to a prisoner. If you want to give them some money, you must give it to the V&C department, that's Visits and Correspondence Department. That's the people that are there that are being responsible for the visits. Never give it to the prisoner. You can usually buy pop or chocolate bars when you visit, but you must buy them at the prison. If you break the rules, you will be in trouble and you will lose 
your visit. If a prisoner keeps asking you to do something wrong, say no. And consider the possibility of having another prisoner to try to be friends with. We're basically people that can tell the difference between right and wrong. You wouldn't be here if you couldn't. So when a prisoner continues to push you in a direction that you don't want to go, you will realize that they're doing something that is wrong and just simply say, listen, I don't want to be asked to do this anymore. The answer is no. Let's try to talk about something else. Let's talk about <coughs> how unique people are in this world. Change the subject, try to do something better. You can expect good to come from your visits. To become someone's friend is enjoyable, and you can look forward to this. Time goes by, and as you get closer to your new friend, you will feel good about yourself, because you are service to help others. It is a gift of grace. I want to share with you how I am working with Jesus on a daily basis and the difference this is making in my life. Recently I started to take medicine to cure an illness I have. They needed to take me off a of medicine that I was using and in the eight weeks I had been feeling quite badly, but it was a choice I had to make. Daily prayers and trying hard to make it through each day as a parent has been really tough for me. Without Jesus and God, I would be lost. I say that so easily. It's really hard to try to express to you just what it means to, I mean, it's not too. I, I, I can think back to the time that I made my walk and what what it meant to me inside prison. I just got so frustrated with the prison authorities that I decided to take them on in some way. I was going to find out, you know, and show them, you know, where they were wrong and locking up people and talking about this, this, this sense of injustice that all people have inside there, guilty or not guilty. If you're a prisoner in a federal penitentiary in this country, you know, you are in real serious trouble. You need to let something take you out of that environment. Something, whether it's your family, whether it's volunteer visitors, whether it's the church, you need supports. In the same, wor in the same way that networking is very important to the prisoner when they get outside of prison, you need supports inside prison. Something that's going to overwhelm the sense of all the bad that's in there. I have been feeling badly, and my solace has been the Lord. I reach out with prayers to help me find peace. I just recently got back on my original medicine, and hopefully this will make me better as it goes into my system. My friend Peter, thank you Peter, has prayed for me. I know God hears his prayers, for he is a good man doing so much to help others. It's good to have a good man on your side. <laughs> I'm feeling a little better. I want to thank all of you for listening to how much difference you can make in a prisoner's life. I ask each of you to go forward with your service to help others and pray your efforts find a home in someone's heart. Thank you very much. Some of you may have some questions or something that you want to say or something that's close to your heart that you want to share. And I like questions. I like people talking. I like to be able to tell you how I feel. I, uh, I feel privileged 
to be here with so many people that really care about life, about beauty, about being service to others, to help others. And I admire all of you for it. I wish I could do as much as you guys do. I really do. Yes, sir. You must have experienced a lot of anger. Do you still feel that anger, or is it beginning to dissipate, or can it? It's an interesting equation, anger, for me in relation to my imprisonment. I, uh, I talk sometimes as an advocate on behalf of the wrongfully convicted. And uh, I'm often told, David, you're, you're, you're very compassionate. You don't really display a lot of anger. You seem to be uh, a very caring, very kind person. And I like that. I like to hear that. That makes me feel good. But you put me inside a room with two or three other wrongfully convicted people for an hour, and I become a person that's angry at the fact that people make and continue to make the mistakes that they make in relation to wrongful convictions. And I wish I didn't feel that, but it's somehow innate, I guess, in some way. Uh, it's really bad that people you know, are placed inside an equation where somehow justice is something that they don't, they don't, uh, they don't get. When in fact, that's what they're supposed to get. And we have a, uh, we have a justice system that has a, uh, a way for people to get out of that equation. They have to apply to the Minister of Justice to, uh, to review their cases. And this particular policy that they have is defunct. In other words, it does not work. So not only is the wrongfully convicted person placed in an equation where they're wrongfully convicted once, they're not going to get out of that situation twice because they don't have the resources and they don't deal with the situation as they should. Next question. Yes, Audrey. Is Audrey? Kimberly. Kimberly, I'm sorry, Kimberly. Getting to the root of the problem, how is it so prisoners, people are so easily wrongly convicted? Where, where does that stem from? Does it stem from the arrest of the police or the courts, the justice system? Um, how does that start? What's, how does that become? What is the percentage of wrongly convicted people? There are a lot of wrongly convicted people inside our prisons and Canadian prisons, more so in the American prisons because there's 10 times as many people inside prison there. Uh, usually it's, uh, you know, eyewitness testimony. It's just, it's false. It's not true. One of the very strongest indicators that someone is wrongfully convicted is the fact that the person themselves that's telling people, hey, 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 I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, they'll continue to do that and they won't stop doing that. And that's a very strong indicator that the person is wrongfully convicted because for the people that are wrongfully, I mean, that are guilty, they might try that for a little while and then they'll just stop. Uh, but, but I mean more specifically, um, is it like pressure from the public on the police to make, arrest somebody, anybody, as long as they get someone to appease the public or? or they have an actual, they have a term for that. And maybe Peter could help me with this. It's called a narrowed vision. Uh, I'm not quite saying that right, but it's a, it's a viewpoint that they, they just don't look elsewhere. They just look at where they want to look at. And that's how they try to convict a person that is, is wrongfully convicted. Uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, if you're focused in only one direction, you're not going to see the whole picture. And uh, I'm not saying it quite correctly, but it, it is a narrow tunnel, tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, that's the word. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so how can we correct that? With our, how can we correct that? Education, I guess. Educating people about it. Yes, please. Um, so 
you spoke about Peter's influence on your life. Uh, are there other prison ministry volunteers that were particularly uh, supportive? And we know your mother played a huge role. So can you tell us about what type of the support system that's really helpful to people in prison? I had one person, a very special lady who's now passed away. Her name is Barb Lever. And she came out to see me while I was in, uh, see, where was she? She was in Moncton. So I would be in Dorchester Penitentiary. And she told me, David, I was writing things, so I decided to show her something that I had written. She said, you are really a very good writer. You should try to take your words and get them published. So that made me feel pretty good. So I remember I tried to send them into a newspaper. It was an international daily newspaper called the Christian Science Monitor. And I sent them into the uh, home form uh, editor, uh, Buckley, I think her name was Buckley. And lo and behold, I get a note back saying they want to publish one of my poems and they're paying me in American money. I was a poet, and that's all it took. I was a poet, and I was so happy for that. And uh, it was just special to have someone. You know, how many people here want to be volunteer visitors but have not yet been a volunteer visitor? Anybody here in that situation? One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, there's quite a few. If I can say this as a prisoner, and I, I'm comfortable with the fact that I can talk as a prisoner because I have been a prisoner for so long. I spent almost 23 years inside Canada's worst prisons. To have someone come out and see you, you know, if you can just try to be a friend. It's not hard to be someone's friend. It's fairly easy. I do it all the time, you know, and I like people, but some people are a little bit, a little bit shy to, to, to take on a friendship, you know, just off the hop like that. But, you know, you may not want to bring God into the picture, Jesus into the picture the first couple of visits. You may just want to play cards, play cribbage or gin. You may want to talk about, I don't know, your cat, your dog, <laughs> you know. Whatever you do, try to do it in a way that, you know, you're just passing along your feelings in, in, in a heartfelt fashion. And uh, you don't have to, uh, the right word is, you can expect the person, the prisoner, on the other side to be, wow, I've got someone here talking to me, caring about me. They're going to, they're going to be very happy. They're going to express themselves in a way that you'll say, boy, this, this person's really thirsty to be my friend. But you know, it's, it's good that, to be able to see that, because don't forget, they live in an environment on a daily basis where, you know, their life isn't that great at all. And uh, you know, when they have a chance, and I'll tell you exactly what I call it, when I have volunteer visitors, I have fresh air. To me, that's fresh air. That's an opportunity to talk to people that are are out in the world that are free. I spent too long in a situation where I, I guess what happened as a result of just <clears throat> appeals and different things falling apart for me, that I became sad. And then I started to want to just put the world outside away from me and just kind of live in the inside world. Uh, the big word institutionalized, maybe that fits. I don't like words like that. but. Yeah, I was, uh, it was really tough for me to, uh, until somebody opened that door and offered me something on my plate that just said, hey, I'm just here to meet you and to tell you about myself and my life and, and the people that I know and about my church, about things like that. I mean, that's, that's not a hard way to introduce church. You can talk about going to church if you want. Uh, I think that's how. I was first introduced to, to ch church. Eventually a person will feel badly about maybe some things that they've done wrong in their life. 
And when they get to that point in time that they actually feel badly about it, that's when they might decide themselves that they want to make a change. And that's where people become better people as a result of the fact that they <coughs> themselves feel that way. Uh, that's the only way that I know of, that a prisoner that's done things that have been bad, you know, feels badly about them for a while, feels that remorse, and decides to change her mind about doing them again, that we can heal, that we can help, that we can reach. And uh, having Jesus in your hearts, saying prayers, you know, just telling someone, you know, I, I feel the need just to tell you that, you know, you, you're a person that I know believes in good things. And uh, I, I just need to tell you that because I feel that way because I know you want to be a person that does believe in good things. Yes? David, have you written a book or are you thinking about it yet? There have been, different, you. There have been different things done. Uh, there have been two movies, there have been uh, there have been some books. My mother wrote a book about me. I have to tell you this. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but you know, I started to read that book and I said, "Geez, you know, I don't know if that's right, or I don't know that it's right." <laughs> my mom, you know, my mom is a blessing. Right now, she's over in where is she now? She's in Victoria right now at a special type of retreat where she gets a chance to uh, kind of relax and enjoy people and, and do different things there that uh, I think she's going to be finished uh, next week. She'll be coming back home to Winnipeg, Manitoba. But without my mom, without her, you know, going to bat against the system that uh, is really not geared for change, you know, you, you, you're up against a system that says, no, and we're, we're not listening to this, these are the rules, you can't approach us this way, you can't do it this way. She got a country, a whole country together, and had them stand up for me. Uh, my mother got me out of prison. Uh, the Canadian public got me out of prison. And, uh, <coughs> How did we get started about my mom? <laughs> <laughs> because she wrote a book and you did Yeah, she wrote a book. The reason I didn't write a book, and it may seem kind of idiosyncratic, if you know what that word is. What does idiosyncratic mean? Anybody? Ridiculous, maybe, somehow. I just didn't want to write about prisoners because I couldn't see any way that I could tell my story without in some way demeaning those people. I care about prisoners. I uh, feel just as strongly about prisoners as I do about people that are wrongfully convicted prisoners. They live a life that, uh, as you saw from your talk, you know, they, 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 they get themselves in, a, in an equation where the things that we are, we are away from, the, the appetites that we have in our life, which are good appetites, they have the bad appetites. That's the type of things that pull people down and take them away from life, from beauty. You know, if we have something to do, something to say about the good things in life, we offer them fresh air, things that they can talk about, things that they can feel good about. That's very important. Yes, sir? When you were in prison and you knew you were wrongfully incarcerated, how did you maintain hope and how did you maintain your faith? Hmm. Well, for a long, 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 long time, it was tough. I didn't have Jesus in my heart. I didn't have the Lord on my side. Uh, and at some points, I just didn't, you know. I mean, everybody talks about David Milgard, tough, never gave up. Well, David Milgard did give up sometimes, but I got back up on my feet. So I thank them for having that equation there. It wasn't until I decided 
This is a part of a story I don't tell very many people, and I don't know how much time I'm eating up here. Please. No, no, you got all sorts of time. You, you yeah. feel free to just tell me to get off. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> I made up my mind to live my life inside prison every single day as Jesus would live his life. Now making a decision like that, making a commitment like that, because you're mad at the system that's got you inside prison. They told me, David Milgard, you're stagnating. You're not doing anything for yourself. You're not going to get out of prison until you start doing some things for yourself. I left that meeting with a parole officer and, and who would be the other person? Classification person. And I was hot. I was upset. And that's where I made my decision. I just, I kind of kept Jesus and God sort of a kind of periphery to me, but never really opened that door until that moment. So then here I was looking at social justice, because when you start looking at prisoners, it's not just a matter of the criminal justice system. It's a matter of different issues, poverty, aboriginal concerns. You have opened up a real big area that you have to be responsible for. I became a group chairman of a group called the Justice Group inside Stony Mountain Penitentiary, where I would bring in grassroots people to talk about poverty, aboriginal concerns, criminal justice system, women's issues. Uh, they said, you can never have a justice group inside this penitentiary, period. Well, I got the justice group in and I called it the justice group. I had to fight prison administrators <coughs> to get it done. <coughs> it was my nourishment. It was what kept me focused on right rather than the wrong, what's inside a penitentiary. I grew inside that equation and it helped me survive when I got out of a penitentiary. People don't realize just what a prisoner is up against when they, they get out. Usually they've got 50 bucks in their pocket, if they've got 50 bucks in their pocket, and they've got five different people that already have been out for a week that don't have anything in their pocket saying, hey, come on, let's go steal something. Come on, come on, come on, come on. When I got out of prison, I had a problem. I had a big problem, and I didn't deal with it very well. And there was this problem. I would go into a place, to a bar, to have a beer. And it would be, David Milgar, how are you? How's your mom? How's the family? Come on, sit down and have some beer. Have some tequila. Have another tequila. Have another tequila. Well, it wasn't very long before I woke up. I was in the motel. And I always get this mixed up, Kamloops or what's right close to Kamloops? Kelowna. Which was it now? Kamloops, Kelowna. It was Kelowna. <coughs> I was in a motel in Kelowna, bottled by my bed. No friends, no one. And I could remember all the faces of the people that kept saying, David, you've got to quit this alcohol. You've got to stop it. Look at the person that's making you. You've got to stop it. At that point, I decided, I was going to get on top of my problem. And I started bouncing a tire around and trying to get into good physical shape. And uh, put that behind me. I don't drink anything anymore. I just know that it almost killed my dad. Well, it did. Eventually, you know, it just poisoned the system so bad that he died. But uh, I stopped. And I'm glad that I did. It's, uh, it's a problem that we all need to keep track of. Uh, I have a son. His name is Robert. He's 12 years old. And I've traveled through those Rocky Mountains, bouncing tires too, uh, many times. And one of the things that I like is very cold water. I like swimming in very cold water. I think the coldest you'll find is in the Athabasca River when it comes up in early March and April. But my son now, when I'm going to different places, and not far from here, actually, you go up to uh, 
to Banff, and then you take a right, and there's a place called Johnston Lake there. I don't know how many people might know that. A few. That's good. Go there. It's a nice place. You can have lunch there. You can walk around there. There's a big, long hiking trail. But uh, we would get into that cold water, and you know, where I would go down to find deeper cold water, my son would be below me going deeper. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of proud of the fact that he still likes the things that I like. Sometimes he does things that I don't like, but that's <laughs> having a 12-year-old is a lot of work. A few more questions. Yes, sir. Um, I like talking to prisoners. I feel, <laughs> I feel, I feel a lot easier talking to you than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> retired prisoners. <laughs> Actually, when I go to check in at the police station, I still have to check in once a month. I go, retired, retired criminal check in. Um, okay, so in the prison system, there's a lot of dead time. There's a lot of time. Uh, when I write to the federal government, uh, most of my uh, writings are about rehabilitation. And I see some rehabilitation going on in there, but I see a lot of... Um, a lot of anti-rehabilitation afterwards, and then I just see way too much dead time. So um, when I write to the federal government, I'm like, why isn't this training going on? Why can't we get these guys doing this? Why aren't um, low, medium, and uh, minimum security prisoners fighting forest fires in BC right now, right? Why, we, we have all this manpower, we have all these resources, but I see a lot of dead time, a lot of you know, I'd sit myself and just be like, what am I doing? I'm a very productive person. Um, I sense that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, uh, and I, and I um, in 2017, before I left from Heller, I had surveyed many of the prisoners uh, when they were having the forest fires last year. And I said, would you go out and fight forest fires? Even if, even if you were just sitting on it water pump, making sure that thing was still running, you'd be good. Yeah, <laughs> And I said, well, what if the $50 or $25 a day they were giving you went straight into an account for the day you got out and couldn't spend it when you were still in? And they said, deal, right? Because like you said, a lot of guys, when they leave, they have nothing, nothing. right? Yeah. Now, I was left out, I, I was cheap, and I saved $800, so when I got out, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and so, um, but, uh, for the rehabilitation and for the, for the use of manpower, what is your view on that? Like, I have strong views, and sometimes my views aren't, uh, uh, aren't received in the way that it should be. I believe that anyone that has done wrongdoing you know, needs an opportunity to feel badly about what they've done wrong and make up their own minds to do right. Uh, I don't like the justice model in this country. <coughs> it's a punitive justice model. Uh, I like Japan has a merciful leniency justice model. You may find it really hard to believe this, but uh, there are crimes that are committed over there, and they're horrible crimes. Murder, uh, rape, <coughs> uh, bank robberies. People never spend a single day in jail. What? What? Merciful leniency. They try to surround the prisoners with family. Usually they like to see a grandmother or a grandfather as part of the uh, people that are uh, much in the same way as uh, the Mennonite Central Committee has. I've got to get the right word for this. Networking, right, Peter? Yeah, circles of support. Circles of support. Uh, they try to have people become close to those that have made the mistake, terrible mistake as it is, and try to help them just become the people they want to become because they need to know, they need to feel that they have done wrong. And they need to make the decision never to make that decision again. There are many people in Canadian prisons that because of emotional upheaval, <coughs> husband and wife, where there's been a murder committed, 
I can't, for the life of me, see giving somebody 15, 20, 25 years inside prison as a solution to that problem. It's ridiculous. It makes me sick. He's right. He's absolutely right. There is so much dead time. And I couldn't coin a better way to say it. You know, if you're inside a prison and you're spending five years, ten years, seven years, whatever you're spending inside prison, and you try to make a difference in your own life, you've got to start, instead of doing time, to use time. You've got to put yourself in a way that he has too, because you can see that he's, he's got things together. You've got to start getting an education, moving into maybe uh, university, uh, correspondence, however you can do it. Sometimes they have outreach programs where they go right inside the penitentiary and you can take university classes. I did that. And you've got to have a good regiment of discipline to keep you on the right road or you'll fall off that road. You've got to do weights, you've got to run, you've got to keep yourself physically fit. You've got to be a person that has a direction. I think it was eight, Angel Gabriel that said, be intentioned in your directions or be, direct, be directed in your intentions. I'm not quite sure the absolute wordage on that. But any prisoner that wants to make a difference in their life, you know, needs to have it together. If you're going out to see prisoners,